back to the beginning of the COVID pandemic. What was the moment, the first moment, where you felt things were bad? Really, really bad, like nothing you'd ever seen before. When I ask this question of most people, they say it was the lines at the grocery stores. People grabbing anything and everything off the shelves. People paying $20 or more for toilet paper. Interestingly enough, almost no one was wearing a mask at that time. When we think of COVID pandemic now, we think of it as a health crisis, and that is true. But in the beginning, in America and many countries of the world, the first crisis was not of health. It was of money. It was about making ends meet for millions of people who live paycheck to paycheck. In fact, the first call to action in the United States after the pandemic was stay at home, flatten the curve, but what did it come with? It was accompanied with money. A $1,200 check dispatched to millions of people within days and weeks of the pandemic. When we think of these things and take them into consideration, this tells us that COVID-19 demanded not one, but two vaccines. One to combat the virus, and another one to combat financial stress, the invisible virus, experienced by people living paycheck to paycheck and heaped particularly hard on those who we ironically call essential workers. This was the tale of things as the pandemic has now gone through our lives. Where we stand today, we have a few choices to make. What we experienced before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and what we will experience after the pandemic, there has to be some difference. One reality of America is millions of people living paycheck to paycheck, barely surviving, barely able to make ends meet. And COVID-19 certainly demonstrated that in complete knowledge for everyone for, to see. Now, there are many solutions for this problem. Raise the minimum wage. Adjust the tax code. Student loan forgiveness. Institute universal basic income in America. These are all ideas, and I think they should be tried. Someone should pursue them. But I am here to offer to you something which is simpler, cheaper, faster, and hiding in plain sight, and it is the pay timing or timing of pay for people. With a little change that can be made and is very easy to implement, there can be dramatic effects in the United States. Now, how did I realize that? Ten years ago, I retired after selling my business with the intent that I will never work again. And it was all going very well. Until I learned that the same banks that had been bailed out for almost $100 billion through taxpayer money, which was called Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, were collecting $35 billion every year in overdraft fees. That is one billion overdrafts a year, and that is about five to 10 overdrafts per working person in America. I said, this can't be true. But it was not only true, it was just the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more. There are high interest rate online loans. There are payday loans. There are late fees. There are uh, title loans, auto title loans. And the list goes on and on and on. 
for every tiny little mistake by anyone, there is a wonderful algorithm or a business to monetize you. Who are the people who are paying these fees? Out of curiosity, I went deeper into the data. It turns out that the people who pay these fees are low-wage, hourly workers, with uncertain work and working hours. What that means is their salary every month is different because there may be fewer or different work days each month. Second thing, these people happen to be around the median or below the median wage in the United States. So let's set the record state, uh, straight. What is the median wage in the United States? It happens to be $36,000 a year. What that means is that half the workforce makes less than $36,000 a year, and half the workforce makes more than $36,000 a year. The workforce that makes less than $36,000 in hours or dollars per hour, it's $18 per hour. These fees are paid predominantly by those people who make less than the median salary in the United States. That's one feature. The second thing is that they are kind of algorithmically monetized in almost every area because they are paycheck to paycheck. So the question arises, what is the amount of money every month that a typical low-wage worker in the United States loses, or what's the better word, gets taken away from them, or just sort of blows it up because they don't have the money at the right time, so ka there is a fee on them. So that amount, it turns out to be, is $300 per month. $300 per month on an annualized salary of $36,000 is 10% of your annual income. If you're losing $300 a month, there are 12 months, that's $3,600. Your annual salary is $36,000. You just lost 10% of the money. How many stimuluses can you actually give to such a situation? Because there is money, but that money is lost because algorithms are smart enough that if you're a penny short, a day late, there is someone who's going to monetize you. You'll be squeezed like an orange for the last drop. So that is the reality of the people. So with all that data in my kind of back pocket, I said, what do I do now? And at that moment, I also remembered, and like most of you, when I arrived in the United States 30 years ago, I went to university. I used to get 850 or 875 dollars a month. And uh, one cracked windshield or a blown radiator or a really warm jacket because I was in Colorado could set you back. You could be in a death spiral. And, you know, I went through that and I said, listen, for me, the problem at all times was not about how much I was making. I mean, you could always get by. It was when I was getting the money. It was about the timing of pay. So I said, okay, my life also checks out. I've experienced it. Millions of people in America are experiencing it. So what am I going to do about it? I needed some mathematical economic justification for it, so I went into books. And I said, what happens in the world in famines? It turns out that a Nobel laureate in economics, his name was Amartya, he's actually alive at Harvard, his name is Amartya Sen and he won the Nobel Prize in economics. He was doing research on why people die in famines. Here's what it turned out to be. People die in famines not because there's a lack of food in this world. It happens because the supply chain introduces delays in the process. The chain is warehouses, distributors, logistics providers. Each one of them injects a delay, creates scarcity to maximize profit. What that does is creates delay, so the food doesn't get to the people at the right time, and people die. When you can't eat, you do starve to death. That is reality. When you don't get paid on time, and you're living paycheck to paycheck, and the data says there are 100 million plus people in the United States, and may I repeat that, 100 million people live paycheck to paycheck, they can't be all bad. I don't buy that. There's a problem. So if 100 million people are living like that and they don't get paid on time and they're short of $10, 
what will happen? Somebody will monetize them and there's a fee to be made. And those total fees, by the way, in the United States are $200 billion a year. So I said, okay, something's got to be done about it. There's economic justification, there's mathematical justification, what will I do about it? So at that eureka moment, we invented this simple system called earned wage access. Get paid as you earn. And to make it extremely simpler, simple, I went to businesses and I said to them, I will front the money. I want to be able to pay your employees as they earn and they can get half their uh, salary. I won't give 100% so they can do their big expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Initially, it was successful, but data was getting collected. It wasn't trivial to convince businesses, but it happened over a period of 10 years. And let me tell you, the reaction of most people was as if it was like a vaccine. It was like a panacea. It was like a big solution. And you know what I think? As I think about it all the time, this is like a decade of my life that I'm trying to describe to you in seconds and minutes. I finally figured it out, and I think I finally figured it out. What, does it, what happens when people are able to take small amounts of money? It turns out it's all about dignity. The opposite of poverty is not income. The opposite of poverty is dignity. And we take dignity away from people when we make them ask for money when we have them go to neighborhoods where they're payday lenders and you know, all those kinds of things, if we take that pressure away from them, it makes a big difference. I still recall with sort of great um, emotion almost, I, one of the users of our service, and I went to her, and she used to take 50, 80, $100 every now and then, said I'd ask her, what is it that really makes you, like what do you use it for? And believe it or not, this mother of three, someone who works as an office admin, the most wonderful lady, she says and looks at me and she says, it gives me room for dreams. I said, but you got $50 of your own money because people are paid in arrears. This was your own money. You just got it when you need it. But it gives me room for dreams. It makes space in my brain. To me, this is an America whose, this is a, an American story which hasn't been understood well enough. The plight of the working poor. We do say it's very expensive to be poor, but I think this should be considered very deeply. COVID-19 has created massive realizations for a lot of people. But the biggest blind spot that it has exposed is that millions of people are living paycheck to paycheck. The second biggest thing it has shown is that an economy as great as the United States can actually teeter and fall if you do not take care of people. The third thing that it showed is that, or at least we should learn from it, that after the you know, shock and mayhem of the pandemic, when we rebuild the system, we should not forget what we meant when we said essential. And in conclusion, I want to say something to you. And this is something I believe deeply because I've spent my life in this. I am no, I'm an engineer, right? I shouldn't be doing these things. This is an extremely important thing that America should take very seriously. And the point I'm making is a very basic point. America is not just 50 states. America is 5 million businesses. 150 million people work for these businesses. It is extremely important that we figure out a way. If you do not pay your people, it's not a question of how much that we'll figure out. If you don't pay them on time, if you do not create, take care of them, I think it creates a very bad situation. And it is in that context that I say, we must take care of our employees because they are America. If we don't let them breathe, because pay is like oxygen, if we don't let them breathe, we will not thrive. Thank you.